Hi everyone, this is Alex from Nier, and with me today is Dan Robinson from Paradigm, uh, and we will talk today about uh, Interledger. Uh, Dan, would you, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? And yeah, sure. So um, I, I'm a research partner at Paradigm. I work on um, uh, sort of research and, and, and keeping up with developments in the space, and one of the projects uh, that um, I've been excited about, um, not affiliated with it in any way, it was called Interledger. And the, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been going around specifically talking about some um, components of it, but I think figure we'll give a high level talk about what Interledger is um, and, and how it works, and then get into some of the details about how it differs specifically from, for example, the Lightning Network. And uh, yeah, let's get the high level overview. Great, yeah. So Interledger, you can think of Interledger as a payment network, as a solution for payments where um, one party can send a payment to another party when they don't um, individually have a particular credit relationship with themselves. So canonically, if we want Alice um, to make a payment, let's say to Charlie. Um, so this is because you know uh, Charlie's a vendor, um, or Alice just wants to sort of to, to transfer money to to him. But um, Charlie doesn't trust Alice, so Charlie isn't willing to say extend credit to Alice. Um, so suppose we have another party, Bob, and Bob and Alice have a um, a relationship, a credit relationship, say, and Bob and Charlie have a credit relationship. And again, we're we'll get into what this relationship is, and it, it may be a credit relationship or maybe something like a payment channel. Um, and that's where you get this, the similarities to Lightning. But this is so far a very abstract, um, generalized view of that. This is just that Alice has the capability to pay Bob. So again, that could be over Venmo, that could be in cash, that could be um, over a payment channel, that could be on a, on a ledger. And Bob has the ability to pay Charlie. Um, so what, we're, uh, what we do here to have Alice pay Charlie is that Alice makes a payment to Bob in exchange for Bob making a payment to Charlie. And so um, Interledger is a protocol that allows these peering relationships, which can be, again, like, like they can be sort of uh, on top of a lot of different uh, possible things, and we'll get to that, but allows the, these individual peering relationships to be um, uh, routed, to allow payments to be routed across them. And so, you know, you, you can imagine having many more parties in this in this ecosystem. Um, and here, you know, if you have a major player like Coinbase over here and Kraken over here, there could be, you know, it's, it's unlikely that maybe Alice and Charlie both have relationships with um, with some random person, Bob. But it's very plausible that um, Alice may have an account, say, at Kraken or a payment channel with Kraken. Um, Charlie may have a payment channel with Coinbase and Kraken um, and Coinbase may have a uh, payment channel or relationship with each other that allows then Alice to make payments to Charlie. So this, you know, the, the inspiration behind the Interledger protocol is largely based on the internet um, and sort of the development of these, of these packet switched um, data networks. And so you think of it just as, a, as an internet where instead of Alice sending just data to Charlie going across a series of ISPs, Alice is sending a payment to Charlie and it's being routed across uh, these intermediate nodes. And those intermediate nodes, they called connectors, right? Yep, that's right. So each of these, each of these um, nodes in the in the Interledger uh, uh, protocol is yeah is a connector, and they can have these peering relationships with um, one or more uh, users. And so Alice here is a user who can send uh, to another user by routing over these connectors. And so, assuming that on, on every step, that's some sort of cryptocurrency. It then we can have some sort of proofs that the, that the payment goes through. But if we're talking about Venmo or like... Uh... Right. So, so we're... Um, well, that's, that's, and that's, that's a great question. And actually, and we'll get to that, is, is how do we make this totally agnostic as to what this payment is? So, so and what this relationship is and what, the, and what the currency is. And so if you do something like Lightning Network does, it really has to be a cryptocurrency and it really has to be a cryptocurrency that supports this primitive called um, uh, hash time lock contracts. Um, and also supports payment channels and embedding hash time like contracts, HDLCs within those. And we'll get to what those are. But um, in Interledger, you can really think of this as like completely abstractly. So if this is, um, you know, this could be just like a three USD payment. And this could be then, let's take out a little fee. So like, you know, 299. And then this is 298. You know, so here, the, uh, the payment could be done in dollars over um, a over again, like it could be over Venmo, it could be just a trust relationship, like this is Alice changing her Kraken balance. Um, and you're, but there's ways to make this um, atomic or as atomic as we need it to be. Um, that prevent, for example, if Alice makes his payment to Kraken, 
that prevents Kraken from just keeping the money rather than um, sending it on. And so we'll, we'll get to that. But just, uh, you know, I want to point out this is, it, it really is at a, Interledger starts at a very high level of abstraction. I usually use payment channels when I'm explaining the, uh, it because in, in part that sort of makes the analogy to Lightning Network clear. But um, it really is much more sort of general than that. And you know, I, think, I think you'll sort of see why when we talk about how they accomplish atomicity. Right. And uh, yeah, so I, I would be interested to know how we make it so that we don't need to trust any two parties on the, yep. on the way. Right. So we, let's, let's talk a little about um, HTLCs first. So HTLC stands for hash time lock, hashed time lock contracts. Um, at least that's how, what it is in the, in the Lightning Network paper. People use different things. Um, and the idea of, a, of an HTLC is that it's a contract, which means you, you can put some money into it, and it can be unlocked in one of two ways. So it can either be um, unlocked by the recipient. So there's two parties involved. So like, you know, this might be here, like Charlie. The recipient, um, by revealing a hash pre-image. So that's a secret that the recipient knows that the, uh, that the sender doesn't know, um, that the sender is able to, to reveal, and in exchange, the HTLC will just give them the money. Um, this is when you would do one on-chain, for example. Um, and the alternative way it can be spent is, uh, it can be uh, unlocked, is the sender can unlock it after a timeout. And so the principle of an HTLC when you do it on-chain, and I think the simplest way to think about it when you're learning it is to, is to just imagine this being a Bitcoin address, which you can do um, this entirely on chain on Bitcoin. Um, and actually, let me just plug a project of mine that I worked on while I was at Chain um, called Ivy. And Ivy is a smart contract language for um, Bitcoin script that compiles to Bitcoin script. And if you go to this um, site, you can, ivylang.com, is that org? I think we have both. <laughs> um, and uh, if you go to the site, you can actually see an example of an HCLC contract that really sort of shows this logic um, and that can be compiled into a Bitcoin script address that does this. So if you imagine it's a Bitcoin script address, someone, um, typically the sender, put, uh, who puts the, uh, uh, this information into the, uh, sorry, puts a put Bitcoin into an HCLC on-chain, um, and then the recipient can unlock that when they, by revealing this pre-image, um, that they know. And if they don't unlock it within a certain set period of time, um, so typically it's like 24 hours or so after, after um, they create this, uh, if they don't unlock it, then the sender is able to cancel it and just pull the money back. And so what this is used in on-chain, most famously, is for a cross-chain atomic transaction protocol. And the way that works is if you, ha if you want to trade Bitcoin for Litecoin, um, what happens is, you know, if, if Alice, Alice has, um, you know, like like uh, one BTC, and Charlie has one hundred LTC. I'm not sure the current price. And as we all know, Charlie Lee, the founder of Litecoin, famously dumped his all his Litecoin at the uh, height of the bubble. So let's imagine here, Charlie's trying to get entirely out of Litecoin and get into Bitcoin. Um, Alice, the, the way the protocol works is first Alice um, creates an HTLC that locks up this Bitcoin. And this is, um, she, she uses a hash pre-image that she knows in this case, and uh, Charlie doesn't yet know. So Charlie isn't able to, uh, to open this unless he gets the pre-image. Um, Alice is able to get it after like 48 hours. Then, uh, Charlie sees that this has happened, goes and creates a matching HTLC with a shorter timeout on the Litecoin chain. So this just involves sending this Litecoin to an address. Um, and this has a shorter timeout, but uses the same hash that he saw in this, that was, that was used in this uh, HTLC. So in this one, Charlie is the sender and Alice is the recipient. Alice sees this, now she can unlock this within the 24 hours and she gets the Litecoin. Poor Alice. And then uh, Bob, no, sorry, sorry, Charlie now knows this pre-image. So Charlie, by seeing this transaction on the chain, learns the pre-image and can spend, um, and can, can unlock this HTLC and receive it. 
Um, so that is a protocol. I mean, that's a very old protocol for atomic cross-chain swaps, and it works on-chain. The innovation of the Lightning Network was to embed these within payment channels. So this isn't just a cross-chain atomic uh, swap protocol. It really allows you to do it across any two ledgers. And a payment channel can be considered just an off-chain bilateral ledger between two parties. So if, the, if, you, if you're familiar with the payment channel, the idea is that two parties lock up some, some assets on the main chain into a contract. They transact off of it by signing messages back and forth to each other off-chain and update the state of that ledger, and then are able to exit it to the, to the main chain. Um, again, this isn't a talk about payment channels, although they play a very important role in both Lightning and uh, Interledger. Um, and they're very, it's a very important protocol uh, generally. But you can just think of it being an off-chain ledger that can be settled after a delay period to the main chain. Um, and it's only between two parties. So um, in this case, uh, supposing we're doing this, we're doing this as uh, a, uh, a Lightning Network payment, you do sort of similar principles with HTLCs. Um, but you do it in payment channels. So here, this is a payment channel between Alice and Kraken. This is a payment channel between Kraken and Coinbase. This is a payment channel between Coinbase and Charlie. And so here, what happens is um, Alice, I'm sorry, in this case it would be Charlie generates a pre-image, um, hashes it, gives that hash to Alice. Alice creates a three Bitcoin payment uh, HTLC in her payment channel with Kraken. So Alice has some money in her payment channel with Kraken. Um, she has some balance. Kraken has some balance. She has to have at least three BTC. She reduces that balance and gives that um, money that, there that would be uh, was previously hers, puts it into a contract. And this means that if you settle the payment channel to the main chain, you'll get an HTLC like this. So you need to add a little time delay just to allow the payment channel to be settled. But if everything goes uh, sideways, uh, Alice would be able to settle this to the main chain um, and hopefully settle the HTLC within time, uh, within the, the, that amount of time. So only in the worst case, though, do you actually have to settle to the, this HTLC to the main chain. So um, Al, yeah, Alice, Alice uh, locks this up with, with Kraken. Um, and then Kraken um, creates the same HTLC. See, they, see, they see that they've, had this, they've, they've received this HTLC in this payment channel. They can create one with Coinbase with the same hash. Um, uh, and so this one, let's say, has uh, you know the uh, the 72 hours. Um, this one has uh, 48 hours. Uh, this one, so they put in a HTLC here with a 48 hour timeout, and this one with a 24 hour timeout. And so these timeouts, because you remember here, they have to be staggered, um, and and sort of uh, because if um, something goes goes wrong over here. Um, then Coinbase needs enough time to actually claim, uh, I'm sorry, then the Kraken, if Coinbase claims this HTLC at the last second, Kraken needs enough time to use that pre-image to go settle this one on the main chain. So and these, these, these numbers don't take into account the payment channel um, uh, difference, but it isn't, again, it isn't, it isn't really sort of that important for the or discussing here. Uh, and yeah, so the, uh, so really, yeah, this really should, really should be like 48, 72. All right, Matt Olympiad, what's uh, 72 plus 24 and 96? Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, so they create these uh, these HTLCs. Charlie, remember, has the pre-image. He reveals that pre-image, and each of these payments can complete. So the analogy I use is that you know how lightning strikes. Uh, it doesn't stri lightning doesn't strike from the lightning strike that you see doesn't come from the sky to the ground. That's like there's a very sort of faint lightning strike. And you can see in, in uh, the talk I gave at Stanford, I have a, vid a video of this. If you just Google lightning slow motion, you can see this. Um, the path that, you know, as it sort of goes down, it's, there's sort of a very light trail that finds a path down. And lightning strikes up. So here you see these sort of like these ions being uh, you know, uh, charged here. You see these HTLCs being locked. The actual payment um, happens after Charlie uh, reveals their pre-image. So Charlie gets paid first before Alice has really sent any money. She's locked up some money, but she doesn't send anything until Charlie receives his money. Therefore, telling, by, by telling Coinbase in their payment channel, um, saying, here's, here's the pre-image. Please settle this, this HLC in the payment channel. If Coinbase doesn't uh, uh, comply, they just settle to the main chain. Um, Coinbase, so then, yeah, so Coinbase uh, reveal, reveals it to Kraken. Kraken reveals it to Alice. And each, along each of these steps, they complete it. If at any point something goes wrong, um, they can settle it to the main chain. 
So again, what I've just explained here is how Lightning, how Lightning Network works. Because in Lightning Network, you're embedding these HTLCs within the payment channels. Right. But obviously, then you can only use cryptocurrencies. That's right. So one, one problem with this protocol is that these relationships have to really have to be either on-chain, just like I'm on a, on a blockchain with you and I can send you an HTLC on-chain, um, which tends to, be, tends to be a little uh, slow and expensive, um, or inside a payment channel that supports HTLCs. You could conceivably imagine that Venmo could add support for HTLC-based payments or something like that. It's, it's a little fanciful. Um, you know, banks, banks have talked about, um, you know, as part of their blockchain research, like, ooh, should we be supporting HTLC-based payments? I think it's kind of a non-starter, and one of the reasons is that I think there's a much better way to do atomicity than this. Um, so yeah, so that's one downside that you identified there is that it has to be on something uh, substrate. This payment, this uh, payment relationship has to be on some substrate that supports HTLCs for this to work. Um, another downside is this griefing problem. The risk that um, what happens, remember, in the happy case, all this money is locked up. So this is a total of, um, of almost nine Bitcoin locked up. Uh, what happens if so they're, they're all waiting for Charlie to reveal his pre-image? And this is information that's uniquely in Charlie's possession. What happens if Charlie doesn't reveal that pre-image? This money stays locked up for at least 48 hours. Because um, if, if Coinbase just, just cancels this, it's uh, just cancels, is willing to cancel the HTLC with Kraken and try to free up this Bitcoin, there's always a possibility that at the last second, Charlie will come in, settle the payment channel, and settle the HTLC. Um, so this mo the money all along these, these hops is locked up for at least 48 hours if just if Charlie doesn't, um, uh, doesn't reveal that pre-image. And uh, here, again, like, you, can, you can cancel it after 48 hours, but it's still, um, there's three Bitcoin in this like, major payment th uh, throughway here between Coinbase and Kraken. Imagine they've got a, a big payment channel with each other and Lightning Network liquidity is a little expensive. Any old user receiving a payment can just grief uh, anyone, any intermediary, the entire uh, chain of hops by just withholding this pre-image. And this, you know, right now we have this, like, Lightning, they talk about supporting 20 hop payments, but um, realistically, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's debatable whether that will be the best architecture. But one reason is that the longer this payment is, the more people Charlie can grief. So if this goes to a lot of other nodes in between, each of these uh, steps is three Bitcoin that gets locked up. So it's linear in the number of hops that were. But also, each one is 24 hours longer, right? Yes, but, um, and this was something the Lightning Network people pointed out to me, if you, if once Charlie doesn't reveal this pre image, um, after 48 hours, Coinbase can safely cancel the HTLC with Kraken because they know Charlie won't claim it. So that, as long as Charlie's griefing everyone, then the problem is only, it's only 48 hours. If Coinbase or whoever's in this position decides to grief everybody, then everyone before them is locked up for 72 hours. So it's still a linear griefing attack because they're, what they actually lose is the value of this Bitcoin for that, for that 72 hours. So they lose, th you know, um, I guess it's like nine Bitcoin days um, of capital lockup. Um, and they cause some multiple of that to be lost um, along each of these hops. But like the hop now, let's say it's 20 yeah. hops. Yeah. This person can, can grief Alice for 20, 20 That's right. days. Absolutely, yes. Um, Alice and whoever, yeah, this, this, this person can grief this person and Alice. Um, and lock up this money in this channel, which again, you know, that's, 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 so it's, it's a pretty bad attack that can be done by anybody along the chain. And the thing is that, you know, you're just routing a payment here. You don't actually know Charlie. You thought you were just routing, being friendly and routing, routing a Lightning Network payment for a small fee. When Charlie does this to you, you don't even receive a fee if Charlie decides to just cancel the payment. If Charlie doesn't complete it, um, then this party, the, the HTC gets canceled and you actually get nothing for that, having that, that lockup. So that's a problem. Um, the final problem, and this is one that's gone a little more mainstream, is... Uh, People used to talk about a multi-asset Lightning Network, and this would be more similar to what Interledger actually uh, potentially provides. Um, and that's where you have uh, one of the hops being a hop in some other currency, or have multiple hops here. So the use case here, and this is one thing that's part of the broad Interledger vision, is if I make a payment to you, I shouldn't care what, uh, where you, your money is, where your, who your account is with, who your payment channels are with. The network should just find a path to you. And I shouldn't even care what currency you want to receive. It should, what, the per currency I want to send and the currency you want to receive don't, ne don't necessarily have to be the same one. All I care about is getting you the money that you want in the currency that you want. Um, and we can imagine just finding a path here. Part of that would be finding a path that includes an exchange rate. So here Coinbase is acting as, a, as an ex exchange, essentially, where they're receiving Bitcoin along this hop, but they are 
paying out um, Litecoin here. So it's, a, it's a potentially very powerful because this gives you a kind of off-chain exchange. Um, the downside when you try to do this with HGLCs that are enforced um, on chain like this has is that the um, Coinbase, so Charlie here, um, let's suppose maliciously, you know, that this is, or not even maliciously, this is a very uh, potentially useful use case for, for Lightning if you want to treat it just as an exchange, is that Charlie is the one who's just trading his Bitcoin for Litecoin. Because um, remember, he's dumping. Uh, when he actually creates this uh, chain of HLCs, he locks in a particular price for Bitcoin and Litecoin, and then he has 48 hours to decide whether to complete that or not. Um, and what that gives him is effectively a, a, a free option, a, an American style call option, where he has the right but not the obligation over those 48 hours to buy um, Litecoin for Bitcoin. So if the price moves against him, then he might decide to cancel that trade and just, and just not let it complete. And so you know, Coinbase thought they were just routing this payment, but actually they end up with this liquidity, A, with this liquidity locked up for a very long time, and also you know, do, executing this trade at what turns out to be a bad exchange rate for them. So it gives Charlie this free option. Mm -hmm. So how does uh, Interledger address all of those? Great question. So, and, and also, I assume Interledger does not have those like 100 hours. That's right. Um, and the reason that it, that it doesn't, um, I'll explain in a second. So Interledger does use HCLCs, but it uses them at a slightly higher layer um, that isn't enforced by the payment channel or whatever this payment mechanism is. So all of this, in Interledger, all of this uh, needs to support is just a, the ability for Coinbase to pay Charlie. Um, so here's how, here's how Interledger um, uh, supports this. Uh, let's talk first just about, imagine we just have a, because um, this, is, this, is this is sort of just a general, uh, more general insight. Suppose we have just Alice and Charlie. Remember, let's go back to trading. You know, we want to trade one BTC for 100 LTC, right? Um, so Charlie wants to send this to Alice, and Alice wants to send it to Charlie. The problem with just Alice sends it first to Charlie, um, and then Charlie sends it next to Alice is what's the problem with that? Uh, well, Char Charlie will keep the BTC. Right. Charlie, Charlie could, could cheat Alice by just aborting the protocol at that point and keeping everything. Um, there's a problem because right now Bitcoin is kind of expensive. But what if um, this payment was much smaller? What if it was just 0.001 BTC and this was just, well, one, B one LTC is still a little expensive. Let's, let's add some more zeros, you know, 0.01 LTC. Um, if this happens, if, Char if Alice sends this to Charlie, um, and Charlie doesn't send uh, the payment back. Alice is only out 0.001 BTC. Maybe still expensive, but you can make this as small as you want. You can make this one Satoshi. Um, so for a sufficiently small trade, Alice doesn't really have to worry about atomicity because um, if Charlie cheats her, she can just close her channel with Charlie or end her relationship with, with Charlie, and she's only lost a relatively small amount. So um, that's uh, the basic insight. And what you do here, because we have this protocol for doing this, you just do this over and over again. So you make these, this tiny payment. Charlie makes his payment back, this tit for tat payment back. And then Alice just repeats the protocol over and over again until she's sent the entire B, uh, BTC. So that's um, roughly how you could see this, this happening. And so, um, and, and this happening, uh, like on the graph, like let's say this is Alice again. Alice will send through the entire path one point like one satoshi to charlie that's right and charlie will, se will send one satoshi worth of light coins back um not exactly so here because you're doing you, the way that the trade actually works isn't that the payment goes both ways along these channels it's that it goes only one way but at some point in the middle it gets turned into litecoin mm -hmm. so it, you complete the path here by having coinbase turn this payment into ltc so like so this is so there's a payment you can think of it as a payment from charlie to Charlie, um, you know, this address, this being his Litecoin address, like payment channel over here, and this being his Bitcoin one, where the outgoing thing is Bitcoin, and then by the time it makes it back to him, it's turned into Litecoin. But, th but the natural concern here is that each of those links has a latency, right? Yes. So let's say they're super fast, they're like 0 0.05 seconds. That's pretty slow, probably. Uh, that sounds like about right, right? If I'm sending one Satoshi waiting uh, until I receive yep. my Litecoin, I guess if it's Charlie, it's the other way around. Uh, then, then in order to send like one BTC, that's going to take me years. That's absolutely true. Um, and so that's the that's maybe the biggest downside of this is that a large payment 
um, if you have very small amounts of trust along this, uh, takes time proportional to the size of the payment. Um, I think I think that isn't isn't necessarily that big a concern, and we'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But um, just to just to sort of explain how the how the mechanism of this works, we still do an HTLC um, because we still want people along the way to know. Uh, it's not we don't just optimistically send this like this Satoshi because then we don't know if someone along the way steals it. We, we we're not we're uh, not sure who. So we still do this do an HTLC, but we do it. It's, it's not enforced by the inside the payment channel or whatever the payment is because in fact even if it was a payment channel it wouldn't be worth uh, enforcing it with an HTLC because just the, the gas cost or the or the fees of actually creating that HTLC output and settling it costs around like it's around like 50 cents I think um, and so any payment below 50 cents on the lightning network by the way is not enforced uh, by the uh, by these payment channels so if you're making payments that small you are trusting your immediate counterparty that they won't um, sort of uh, board the protocol and, and have you lose that money. Um, so that's, that's, that's you know, the, sort of the dirty secret of, uh, that Lightning doesn't actually use these HTLCs in this way. But they still, you still do it um, on the, at the higher layer. So you create an HTLC, and this is for, you know, yeah, let's, let's say it's one Satoshi for now. Um, and because it's not enforced by the base chain, we can have this be a very short timeout. So this could, you know, this could just be like, I don't know, 15 seconds or something. Um, and then this timeout could be 10 seconds, one Satoshi. Oh, annoying fees here. Um, and this one could just be like five seconds. I'm not sure about the exact times they want to use. Um, one Satoshi. And each of these is, they call this, I think, a hash time locked agreement. It's something enforced between Kraken and Coinbase that they can detect that their immediate county party has cheated them um, because they haven't, you know, they haven't received a message from them, but they, you know, they like, claim that they did. Uh, and that's a problem between them. Um, it's not enforced by the ledger, and it doesn't matter to anybody else. So if, um, if, you know, if, if you lock up all these Satoshis and then Charlie completes this payment, uh, Charlie receives a Satoshi and it's just you know, up to what happens is Coinbase reveals the pre-image to Kraken and then Kraken potentially cheats Coinbase here by not uh, actually making this payment or updating their payment channel to pay this one Satoshi. But in that case, Coinbase knows that and able to close their payment channel with Kraken. It would just be sort of a silly thing for them to do. So that's, that's sort of how the, how the protocol is built on top of um, uh, on top of just these, these vanilla payments using HTLCs at a higher layer. So you asked a great question, which is about the, uh, the latency. So reasonably, um, I think we could say, like, at minimum, around 50 cents uh, is a reasonable trust limit because that's what it costs to settle an HTLC on the main chain. In fact, it should probably be higher because at that price, all the money that you put in that HTLC, if you try to settle it with an HTLC, just like gets paid into fees. So it's so it just sort of gets lost. So really, you honestly have to go like significantly higher for something to be worth actually settling with an HTLC on the main chain. So if you're doing Lightning, and then the other thing that you're you're trusting um, the funder of a channel trusts their counterparty in some sense uh, because the funder is paying some fees for this uh, to open this channel. And so if the counterparty just closes it um, or forces them to close it, the funder ends up losing the amount of these fees, and that can be you know uh, fifty cents more or, or more. Um, couple dollars. So there is this uh, counterparty trust, but remember, this is only a very local form of trust. This isn't global trust where I have to trust everybody who's downstream of me in a payment. Um, the, uh, so I reasonably think this doesn't have to be one Satoshi. Um, it could be, it, has, it can be sort of at least 50 cents. Maybe let's say it can be a dollar. Um, and that, this is the amount that you have in flight at any particular time. So there could be a lot of payments going from Coinbase to Charlie, and you don't actually have to update the payment channel until the their net amount is, uh, is more than a dollar from where their last state of the payment channel was. And then you have to actually update the payment channel. So the way that Interledger is working to sort of try to sort of optimize this is that you have all these packets and payments going back and forth, and you're sort of constantly every, every um, you know, 0.1 seconds or something updating your payment channel to reflect the latest balance so that you don't, so that, you know, you don't actually end up going over the, your total in-flight limit, the amount that Charlie is willing to trust Coinbase here. Or uh, it's Coinbase is willing to trust Charlie. But if, so you're saying I don't need to trust everyone on the way, right? But if I'm yep. sending money through a multi-hop, multi mm -hmm. um, like, like a se sequence of connectors, and, and someone very late in the sequence doesn't send money, yep. then effectively I just lost my, my $1. But I'm not closing my, my channel. No, no, so wait, you haven't lost it because remember we're doing this with this hash time lock agreement. So you haven't even updated your channel yet. All you've done is entered into an agreement with Kraken um, and here it was like, you know, if, if we, it's, just, it's just immediate. Oh, so it's going to be Kraken who loses money in this case. No one loses money, actually, if it, does, if it doesn't complete. Because 
I've locked up this Satoshi for 15 seconds, and I say, we say, OK, this one Satoshi is you know, um, reserved for this particular payment. Um, and if, if I get this pre-image of this hash, I will pay the Satoshi from Charlie to Kraken. Ch uh, Kraken says to Charlie, I will pay um, this one Satoshi for, a, uh, um, for, a, for this, um, for this pre-image. But they haven't actually made any payments yet. So if Coinbase doesn't complete it, then they just time those out. And it's very similar to oh, but, but on the other way, then it's on the other when it goes backwards, right? So Charlie yep. closes. So right. Somewhere on the way, someone can choose not to send that one one dollar now. It's not one Satoshi, That's anymore, right. right? So so who in that case someone does lose money, right? Well, it's, gonna be... it's no. So so right. So w let's think about what happens. The actual protocol for doing this this completion here is that first Coinbase reveals the pre-image that they learned from Charlie to Kraken, and then they update the payment channel so that this payment goes through and Coinbase's uh, balance is one dollar higher. Mm -hmm. So what could happen here is Coinbase reveals that pre-image, and then Kraken uses it to complete this payment from Alice or, or from, you know, from Charlie. So Kraken gets this money, but Kraken doesn't update this payment channel with Coinbase. The only person who's been cheated here is Coinbase. And Coinbase still pays Charlie. Coinbase has already paid Charlie when that, when that thing happens. Charlie. So that's the key idea here is that the last payment, the recipient receives the money before the sender has even sent it. Mm -hmm. and Along each step, you're only ch you can only be cheated by your immediate counterparty. And so Charlie can cheat Coinbase. Um, Coinbase can cheat Kraken, and Kraken can cheat uh, oh, The other way Charlie. around, right? I think it's the other way around. Yep. Um, so what happens, right? Charlie reveals the preimage, and then Coinbase, yep. So Coinbase can cheat Charlie, Kraken can cheat Coinbase, and Charlie can cheat Kraken. By the way, you could flip that. So there's no, there's no particular reason why um, it, the protocol for updating this couldn't be Coinbase uh, makes the payment and then Charlie uh, provides the pre-image. Right. So um, yeah, so you can sort of have that have that cheat go either way. And so the question is, do we know the the structure of the network? Or so when I'm again, it's easier for me to think that this is Alice. It's a separate yeah, sure, entity, yeah. right? But let's say Alice is, wants to pay Charlie, mm -hmm. and she happens to be connected to Kraken. Does she need to know how Kraken is going to send it to Charlie? Or that's just, right. just say, Kraken, if you have any path to Charlie, please complete this payment. In the Lightning Network, they use source routing, which means that Alice tells Kraken exactly the path to go. Uh, and I believe they have onion routing, in fact, which means that Alice can tell Kraken just the next path to take and give a blob of unencrypted blob of data that Coinbase will then be able to un unencrypt to find out the next path to go. In Interledger, they use something more similar to what the, uh, how the Internet Protocol um, does routing, um, where Alice just tells K Kraken the final interledger address, the ILP address. And the ILP address, um, again, like, I don't want to get too much into the details about that, um, but it's sort of like an IP address in that it includes in it some information about how to route the, how the sort of default way to route this payment. Um, because it's, it's, it's the sort of network you imagine is structured in this hierarchical way. So just by telling Kraken this address, Kraken then knows the best path to sort of continue um, that, that uh, packet's path to, the, to Charlie. So yeah, so we call in Interledger we call these packets because again they're these very small, um, economically relatively insignificant um, amounts of payments that are just made uh, in you know uh, quick succession um, in order to complete this large payment. So you asked about um, the size of the payments. So again, we can do uh, one dollar if optimistically you say we could do. You imagine we could do um, ten updates. So first of all, it's not uh, a limit on. I want to say it's not a limit on. Uh, uh, you don't have to. Alice doesn't have to wait for Charlie to receive this payment. It really is just um, Alice and Kraken have to update their payment channel balance um, this frequently. And if the amount that they have in flight ever goes above uh, or, or above that, that amount, then they have to, they have to cancel. Um, but yeah, I guess, again, yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah. So the, the question here is, you know, if you can do like, t if you can do maybe we can do 10 of these per second. So that's like $10 a second, even at this minimal $1. Um, quite realistically, Coinbase and Kraken can have a higher uh, in flight amount than that, but and but the bottleneck will be the the slowest of, of all of them, right? Um, yes, uh, that's right. But although if Alice has multiple paths, mm -hmm. um, she can send packets along all those paths. They can all go through maybe this massive throughput between Kraken and Coinbase. So if Alice has multiple parties with uncorrelated failure uh, uh, probabilities, then she could conceivably just send packets across all those. And again, like you know, they could maybe even all find their way along this one sort of like uh, superhighway here. But yeah. I guess important. So, so if I understand correctly, importantly, Charlie would only lose money if specifically the uh, the his neighbor. That's right. So it's all local trust. It's all trust with your immediate counterparties. 
Um, you know, Charlie doesn't have to trust anything about the system. And this is what makes it, I think, superior to the Lightning, uh, the Ledger in four stage GLC model, where you can be griefed for a very long time. Here, Alice can only be griefed for like 15 seconds of one Satoshi, which is nothing, or one dollar, um, which is very little. Uh, in, the, in the griefing model, yes, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that Charlie can steal um, any money, but the griefing of losing like the whole three Bitcoin for a um, for uh, 72 hours potentially is just like catastrophic compared to the cost of losing a dollar, and it's uh, it's not localized. So Coinbase didn't do anything wrong, and Kraken is still uh, griefed for this amount. So that's the that's that's sort of the uh, problem with that, um, and why I think it's it's much harder to solve with a reputation system than something where here when you open a channel with someone really only has to be local reputation. So yeah, so I said you know I think Coinbase and Kraken the very well known parties only one of the parties in the payment channel needs to be semi trusted by the other, uh, so one of them can be anonymous. Sorry. Oh, I thought I thought you were you were saying that the sender has to be. It, it it can be, but it could be. You could switch it. So like you could say again that Alice makes the payment first, and then Kraken shows her the pre image. Mm -hmm. So if you just change the protocol in that way, or just along each of these steps, you could have the burden um, of, of of cheating fall on whichever party you want. So if you imagine like not, for example, a very well known um, party, but a pseudonymous party, even one that has reputation, um, or like a, like a gray area. Um, you know, something you know, people are willing to trust Silk Road with a lot of their money, um, uh, certainly for a short period of time. I think like Shapeshift is a good example here of a party where people are willing to take the counterpart. We're, we're willing to take the counterparty risk that Shapeshift would steal, would steal some of their money when they sent it because it was only for a few seconds. So there's no custody that's going on for a long time there. And Shapeshift has been around and has a lot of, uh, of reputation that they would lose if they, if they uh, fail to complete these payments. So each of these parties can, is, can be kind of thought of as like Shapeshift. Um, when they're routing these payments because they're receiving um, one you know, kind of payment and they're paying another and taking fees. Um, and so, yeah, so I imagine again, even in uh, a totally um, pseudonymous network, even in a decentralized network, it's quite possible people would be willing to, to trust a relatively high amount to parties that are at least you know, somewhat well known and that have a good reputation. But, but how do you, so, so say I want to send a payment, I never used Interledger before. Yeah. So I need to find someone who will trust me even though I'm completely unknown entity. That's not necessarily true. You could, you could find somebody who you trust um, and open a channel with them and just give them the burden. So one way to do it would be, you could do it even where you're receiving this, but you just make an upfront deposit uh, and say like, you know, if we, when we close the channel, I will lose this amount, Alice will lose this amount to Kraken. And then you can do these payments and Kraken will know that they are um, the most, you know, the most they can lose in any, uh, by Alice aborting the protocol at any point is less than the deposit that Alice, Alice has with Kraken. Um, one more point that I want to make about that, because I think it's interesting, is over time, so when this, when this initially happens, maybe Alice makes a deposit that is, that's, you know, uh, um, covers whatever she would, she'd be able to steal. Um, over time, uh, we can grow this limit because Alice has been paying fees to Kraken over the lifetime of this channel. And so if Kraken is collecting just like, you know, 5% fees and Kraken wants to limit their loss to Alice to being just like 50% of the total lifetime value that Kraken has, has um, received from Alice over the course of the channel, that, or no matter what, what you set those percentages to, that's actually exponential growth in what the size of the, of the um, trust limit is. Because um, as each payment gets made, Alice is paying more fees to Kraken, and Kraken is able to, um, to raise the trust limit for the next payment because they've received some fees. And thus, if Alice cheats, eventually, you know, Alice will still have paid Kraken a lot over the lifetime of that relationship. And so if Alice is making, tries to make a very large payment over this network, um, in so doing, she could be just exponentially raising the value of her, um, uh, this, this, the trust limit on her channel. And again, I say exponentially, it is, um, it's sort of a small exponent, but it's uh, a small, or small base, but over time, you know, again, that, that still can grow to potentially be a very large uh, amount of money over the lifetime of this channel. And so you're saying, let's say the fee is 5%, right? If Kraken themselves take 5% fee and we have three hopes, that's... Uh, Yes. So right. So you wouldn't. It wouldn't. Right, it's, it's true. It wouldn't be a five percent fee. I feel. I'm not sure what the fees right now in the Lightning Network are. I feel like maybe it's one percent or less. Um, I guess. Yeah. It's probably. I think it's less than one percent. So it's true. Um, I think. The, and I think the fee model in this generally hasn't really been figured out um, for either Interledger or or, um, uh, or for or for Lightning. I, I wonder actually if in a lot of these cases it'll turn out to be a kind of loss leader where you'll provide um, routing for very cheap, uh, maybe free, and just monetize the user in other ways. Um, and you know, again, I think there's, there's there's bad ways to do that where you're where you're monetizing their uh, their data, 
And there's other ways to do it where it's just, you know, like this is this is a service that Coinbase or Kraken provide to their customers and they make money on like exchange fees mm -hmm. or something else. And when Alice sends to Charlie, does she upfront says the the max fee that she's willing to pay and then it just distributed? Yeah. So um, when Alice uh, I, so with, in, in Interledger, um, and I'm a little more familiar with how Interledger does this, a packet is very simple. It just has, I believe, the destination address, which includes in it the um, this sort of hierarchical ILP address, which also um, covers, I believe, what currency Charlie wants to receive it in. So if Charlie has multiple um, uh, different currencies they can receive things in in different channels, uh, that's covered by this address. Um, and I believe the amount. Um, and what this amount is, is actually the amount that's being sent. And so what happens is as this amount, so it, it, this is, this will just be like, so Alice will send this and it'll be, you know, $1. Um, Kraken takes their fee out. And now that packet, this packet that they send on says like 99 cents. Um, and then here the packet that they send on says like 98 cents. Um, and the, yeah, so again, I'm, I'm, I maybe I'm, I'm worried about mis misrepresenting this, but the basic idea is that Charlie receives this, and if this is less money than they expected to receive in this payment, um, they can just cancel it if they if they need to. Um, but the idea is that you know they they take into account okay some fees got lost along the way got taken got taken out along the way, um, and they say okay is this a reasonable amount to receive based on what on what Alice sent? Okay. So again, and that that all is handled at higher levels of the protocol. Um, so as sort of the base packet format, I believe it's just uh, ILP address and. The destination ILP address, not the source address, um, and the amount uh, that is that is in this particular hop. I, yeah, you can look at. So if you look at interledger.org, you can see the the latest spec for ILPv4, which um, tells a little more about the things like packet format. And so, for example, let's say somewhere in the way we have someone who converts it to um, to like US dollars. Yeah, they would still exchange some sort of uh, HTLC between that, them. That's right. So. Because the, the HLC is the HCLA, the hash time lock agreement is happening at a higher layer than the payment uh, layer. On the payments um, level, it's it really is just um, simple payments back and forth between Coinbase and Charlie. And so you could do this with anything. You could do it with um, uh, with uh, dollars if you made like you do it with wire transfers, although they may not be high laten uh, low latency enough. You could do it with tossing pennies across the Grand Canyon. Anything that supports making small. Uh, relatively small payments amount variance relatively quickly um, can support this. So one thing I'll note is that this protocol is not particularly good, at least in my opinion, if the channel, if, if this payment relationship is something that's just settled on chain. So this is what, something that was sort of originally part of the vision of Interledger. I think it's it's still it's still something that they um, that they talk about and support. And I think they 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 have maybe slightly different views on it than me. But the idea is, um, Alice, you know, we could we could have these relationships be that uh, they make these payments. You know, this payment relationship is just we're on the same blockchain, right? So I guess Coinbase and Charlie are on the same blockchain, and Coinbase is making just Bitcoin payments on the ledger to Charlie, and Kraken is making, you know, like like Litecoin payments on the ledger maybe to Coinbase. And this is so this is not as good a protocol for that because um, the cost of doing and latency of doing an on-chain payment is much higher. Um, oh, so in this case, you're saying like each link would yeah. be on-chain. Right. So if, if, if each link is settling on chain rather than just by s sending signed messages to each other in a payment channel, which is practically free, if they're settling on chain, it's sort of hard to do these many tiny payments. And that's where maybe like the idea of using an uh, HLC on chain gets more attractive. My opinion, though, is if you if you've got a, uh, if you're using like instead of using HLCs on chain, you can just open a payment channel on chain and do the micropayments protocol over that. Um, so I really don't see much of a use actually for these ledger enforced HLCs. I think the micropayments uh, protocol is, is superior. And so feasibly, uh, again, let's say that uh, that at some point we're converting it to fiat, mm -hmm. and then from here, yes. let's say it's a Venmo payment, right? Yep. So these two entities, they they are unlikely to be sending like one dollar to each other over any sort of because right. that also costs money, right? Yep. So so feasible. So the expectation is that they will have like a significantly higher limit and they will just accumulate yep. and then settle it within like 10 days. That's right. Yep. And you know, and, like, the settlement, for example, it doesn't have to be Venmo. If, it, if this is Coinbase, you can imagine this settlement just being Coinbase updating Charlie's USD balance. Which, um, which is already a trust with a very high. Exactly. Um, so because Charlie, because Charlie's willing to say, like, I believe that Coinbase, um, you know, I, I, can, I can hold this credit relationship, essentially. And this was one of the, what I think in Interledger they called the Enlightenment at one point, was realizing it was originally a protocol for these cross-ledger atomic transactions. Um, where these entities like Coinbase that were ledgers, where somebody would be, or, or Bitcoin, you know, the Bitcoin ledger was treated as like, this is a ledger and we're settling on that. 
Um, the, uh, the realization is that you know, Coinbase here, maybe they're running a ledger, Venmo's running a ledger, but in some sense, they are just another connector. Um, it's, it's a credit relationship that Charlie has like, with Venmo. So again, like, this isn't, uh, you know, because Venmo isn't necessarily isn't really exactly participating in the protocol, but you can kind of imagine this being um, a uh, Venmo being another hop on this, um, where Alice is making, if Alice makes a payment to Kraken by updating their Venmo balances. And again, like, that's really just a payment sort of rippling through another semi-trusted another tr semi counterparty there. Actually, a very trusted counterparty mm -hmm. in that case. Yeah, right. it's an interesting fact. Cool. Did, did you cover everything, or is there something else that is? Yeah. So I mean, I think that's uh, that's most of what I know about ILP. Uh, about ILP, I'm very focused on, like I said, the this HTLC issue, um, and uh, and why I think so. If you want to learn more about that, you can see my uh, my talk on at the Stanford Blockchain Conference. HTLC is considered harmful, um, and that's online. The video and slides from that are online. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, if that's, I think that's uh, basically interledger. And again, I think it's it's a uh, protocol where uh, potentially it could it could be a payment channel protocol across every blockchain network. Um, it's a uh, payment channel network um, that can go across every every blockchain ledger, um, allowing payments from uh, from anyone you know who has any any cryptocurrency into anyone else without them having to worry about uh, what their what their the currency that they're sending being the same as the currency that they're receiving. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think it has a, it really does have the potential to sort of connect um, at least on a payments layer on a payments layer connect. Uh, a lot of different blockchains. Um, and Interledger is live, right? Interledger is live. Um, do, is do you have like good idea of like how many like big con big links we have, such as like Kraken to Coinbase? It's it's a good question. I think um, so. There isn't yeah. There, there aren't major hubs on it. It's it's. I think it's not it's not as developed right now. I believe as the uh, as the Lightning Network. Coil is um, is uh, has which is the company that that was um, founded by Stefan Thomas, who's one of the uh, inventors of the Interledger protocol. Um, along with uh, Evan Schwartz was the other inventor. So Stefan Thomas opened, uh, started this company, Coil, um, which uses Interledger for uh, web payments for, uh, for monetizing content. Um, again, I'm a, sort of butchering the description of it there, but you can check out um, Coil as a project. But they're using Interledger um, live right now. I think it is, it is live on, um, on Ripple right now. Um, there is a beta of a, of a, a plugin that allows you to make payments to the Lightning Network, where somebody is receiving payments on Lightning. Um, again, I think it's it's still very early on on actually being deployed in production. And, and so, what would it mean in, in the context of Interledger to be live on Ripple? Um, so there, are, you can open a con uh, connection. You can peer with an Interledger connector by opening a Ripple payment channel with them, an XRP payment channel with them, and uh, making payments to them over that. Makes sense. Cool. Awesome. Uh, well, that was great overview. Great. And uh, let's wrap up here. And uh, thanks a lot for watching. Thanks for having me on.